Hi, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, which is coordinated by Open Channels and NatureSurf. I'm also editor for the Marine Ecosystems and Management, or MEME, newsletter. Uh, and I'm so excited to have everyone here today, both uh, wonderful presenters we have coming up, as well as all of you. Um, and before we get started, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jan, who is our uh, moderator. But I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions and send comments in during the webinar. Um, there's a, a question panel in your user interface. And you can go ahead and type in any questions or comments you have. And you can go ahead and do that throughout the webinar. We have um, ample time at the end for a discussion between our panelists and as well as with input from comments from you guys and questions from you guys that will be discussed by our panelists. Um, and we encourage you to send in your thoughts on the webinar throughout the webinar. Um, so feel free to use this at any point, and then know that we will be using all this input during the uh, discussion and question and answer at the end. Um, and if you have any technical questions, please send those in through that same question panel, and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, or you could email me um, the email that you got, all the webinar information from ebmtools at natureserve.org comes to me, Sarah Carr, and I'll do my best to answer that way too. Okay, Jan, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Sarah. Also from my end, uh, hello and welcome uh, to our today's webinar, Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet, uh, on our today's topic, Do Data or Desires Drive MSP? My name is Jan Kleine-Bühning. I'm with GIZ working for the Blue Solutions Initiative. Uh, this is a Panorama webinar hosted by the Blue Solutions Initiative. And before we jump into content, I would like to say a few words uh, about these two initiatives. Do you see the next slide? No, yeah, and sometimes yeah. it gets stuck. Sometimes it gets stuck if it's been sitting up for too long. So actually, if you back out of the presentation and open it up again, uh, it should forward. OK, let me try. And then just put it back in presentation mode. Yep. Yes. You see it now? Uh, we do. We see the okay. starter slide. Yep. Good. Great. Perfect. Second one. So again, uh, Blue Solutions is a global cooperation project funded by the Federal German Ministry for the Environment, and it's jointly implemented by GIZ, a German Technical Development Corporation, Grid Arendal, a center collaborating with UNEP based in Norway, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature (IUCN), and UN Environment. Blue Solutions is a partnership. Uh, to do, do things, basically. One, we share knowledge, share experiences, share things that have happened, share what we call blue solutions. So we are a global knowledge network on the one hand, and on the other hand, we are a capacity development platform. So we offer technical training courses on marine spatial planning, integration of ecosystem services into development planning, and climate change adaptation. Furthermore, we offer some innovative formats like social labs or this webinar series. So the overall objective of Blue Solutions is to support parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity to achieve the marine and coastal IG targets and also to achieve the sustainable development goals of the Agenda 2030, specifically SDG 14. So at the bottom you see our URL and if you click on it you will find more information about Blue Solutions, our activities, and you can also subscribe our newsletter. So Blue Solutions is not just the name of the initiative, but also an approach. And I wanted to explain a little bit what we mean by Blue Solutions. So the idea is that in the realm of the management of coastal marine environments, we have a lot of success stories, approaches, initiatives that have proven success and a positive impact and that others could learn from. So we work with solution providers in the first place, that's the little person with the explanation point, to understand their solutions and curate them in a way that another person, the solution seeker, can learn from it. And we do that by breaking the solution up into what we call building blocks, or in other words, success factors of the solution. The assumption behind is that people who are facing a challenge in their context can learn from blue solutions or from building blocks, get inspiration, and then adapt elements of the solution for their own context to tackle their problems. 
At the moment, we have about 120 plus solutions at the Blue Solutions part of Panorama. And also, uh, we have two solution providers with us today who will present their Blue Solutions so you get a better understanding what this is about later on. Here are some key criteria for Blue Solutions and the underlined are the most important ones. So what qualifies a Blue Solution to be a Blue Solution? First of all, solution has to have a proven impact. So it's not about ideas and papers, it's really about implemented uh, projects with a demonstrated impact. Uh, Blue Solutions are inspiring generally and they support sustainable development uh, in the coastal marine realm. So they have to be thematically relevant and very important they are replicable or upscalable. That means that at least elements of this Blue Solutions can be transferred to other contexts geographically or thematically. So Blue Solution hosts the marine and coastal portal of the Panorama Partnership and Panorama does what Blue Solutions does. It supports cross-sectorial knowledge sharing and learning but it is broader. Uh, at the moment, Panorama has three thematic portals, one on protected area solutions, one on marine and coastal solutions, a third one on ecosystem-based adaptation solutions, and there is a new community on sustainable agriculture for biodiversity upcoming. So we are growing fast. Uh, at the bottom, you see on the left-hand side the Panorama partners, and on the right-hand side the development partners who are financing this endeavor. In the center, again, a URL. Uh, when you click on it, you can browse through the different portals and find more than 300 curated solutions. So coming back to our today's topic, do data or desires drive MSP? Uh, we're coming to the end of um, my introduction. And after me, we have Tundi Agadi, working uh, with Sound Seas and Forest Trends, who will provide us keynotes speech. Um, then we have two solution providers, John Day from Australia and Michelle Portman from Israel. Um, after our presentation session we will have about 45 minutes for questions and discussion. So this is the part where you can come in and as Sarah said you can type in your questions all the time in the question panel. So let's jump into the webinar, into content, and uh, our first presenter for today is um, Tundi Agadi. Tundi, maybe you can already share your screen. Um, Dr. Tundi Agadi is the founder of Sound Seas, a Washington DC-based group working at the nexus of science and policy to advance marine conservation around the globe. She also directs the Marine Ecosystem Services Program of Forest Trends, which specializes in launching innovative financing for marine management. Tundi has published widely on MSP and related topics, including the 2010 book Ocean Zoning, Making Management More Effective. Tundi is an internationally renowned expert in marine conservation with extensive field and policy experience in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, North America, and the Pacific. Tundi, we are very happy to have you with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Good, wonderful. Well, it's great to be with you all. Uh, my intention is to not to really give a keynote speech, <laughs> but rather to provoke some thinking about marine spatial planning and how data support the process um, and can sometimes um, influence the process in other ways as well. I intend to reflect on experiences from around the world. Um, I won't, however, be going into the level of detail that the two solutions providers are presenting. Rather, I'd like to just reflect on some experiences and say that there are kind of four main messages that I hope to get you thinking about and have the webinar um, elicit a conversation about. The first main message is really that data are needed to support MSP. I think that's obvious. But the trick is getting the right data. Um, the second main message is that incomplete information or data gaps do not constrain MSP. 
They do not constrain the launch of NMSP. They may limit the amount of um, progress that can be made initially, but I, I believe that incomplete information should never um, prevent people from actually taking the first step and launching MSP processes. The third message is that decision support tools and other kinds of um, technologies really help in data management and they help uh, planners present options for management, but they do not provide solutions. It's people that provide solutions. And ideally in MSP processes, it's people working in collaboration that come up with the solutions to management challenges. Fourth, and maybe the, the central message of my presentation, is that the goals of MSP, what we intend to achieve with the planning, determine what kinds of data are, need to be harnessed for planning and for subsequent management. So we all know that MSP takes many, many forms around the world. Uh, it, it occurs at many different scales and it, in, um, it aims to achieve a lot of different kinds of objectives. Uh, but what we see today is this sudden interest in expanding the blue economy and really I, I hearken it, it, it to the gold rush times in the U.S. when people suddenly saw options for, um, for development, for enriching themselves, and, and kind of rushed to take advantage of those opportunities, uh, kind of casting aside the carefully thought out processes um, that lie behind MSP and just planning in general. We, um, we have for many decades been, um, have been doing planning and management in the marine realm and we have, I think, developed processes that are robust, that are inclusive, uh, that come up with um, solutions that are egalitarian. Um, these processes generally take um, a number of different steps. The first one being visioning and goal setting. Uh, what follows from visioning and goal set setting is then collection of data on ecosystems, on uses, on impacts, the analysis of those kinds of data, the optimization of policies and zoning to achieve the preferred uh, future that people are looking for, and then finally implementation. In the best processes, stakeholders are engaged up front and are involved in the visioning and the goal setting. So we have, it out of those kinds of processes, many different kinds of reasons for undertaking marine spatial planning. We have, on the one hand, conservation of biodiversity, but in other situations, the main reason for undertaking MSP is conflict reduction or avoidance. It can also be used to clarify jurisdictions so that sectoral management agencies know what their boundaries are physically and um, thematically. MSP can also be used for um, tailoring research so that it uh, comes up with the kinds of data that we need to support better management. Uh, in many, many situations, MSP is used to really enhance ecosystem services and values, um, whether that's for tourism or fisheries or recreation or other kinds of ecosystem services. And then finally, MSP can be thought of as, a, as an approach to really think about the future and think about option values and future opportunities. So there are a lot of different reasons for undertaking MSP, and the data needed to support these kinds of processes is different in every case. Some of these goals require quite a lot of data, and others re require less. But as I said, in the gold rush mentality that we have today with the, with the a desire to really unlock the potential of um, blue growth in many, many places, we seem to be in a situation where sometimes the data or the information get ahead of the goals and the visioning step of the process. Um, 
and I, I, I am being deliberately <laughs> provocative here. I, I know that that's not the case in, in many situations, and you'll hear about two specific examples from solutions providers who use the data very efficiently and very well to achieve clearly articulated goals. But we do have, I think, a situation where particular kinds of information are driving MSP processes. And uh, in particular, it seems to be that this information about ecosystem values, economic values that come out of marine systems, that then spur this rush for the blue growth, seem to be driving the MSP processes instead of supporting the um, MSP processes, instead of supporting goals that are clearly articulated. I know as scientists, we'd like to have as much information as possible, and for that reason, I think there is a tendency to think that we need to have complete information before we can undertake marine spatial planning. Um, as scientists, we also tend to think that this information should be centered on the, the biophysical world and not the social information that is so badly needed, but we need to remind ourselves that MSP is a, an approach that's used for uh, meeting challenges of management, and it's all about human behavior and not so much about control of um, natural systems. It's really the goals of plannings, planning that should drive how plans are designed, which stakeholders are cons consulted, what uses are allowed where, and how management regimes need to be established. So that first step of goal setting and visioning is really absolutely critical. Uh, it, every year I teach a Erasmus Mundus master's course with um, colleagues from the University in Venice. And um, we use an uh, ecosystem services view uh, as both a teaching tool and as a kind of way of experimentation to see how the goal setting influences the use of data. So when we take an ecosystem services view, what we're saying is we're looking at the domain where we're trying to do planning. And in the Erasmus Mundus course, this has been focused on the Northern Adriatic and the Mediterranean region. And although this schematic does not relate to the northern Adriatic and is a tropical uh, in the ecosystem services that we're looking at are, are the same ones. So we're looking at fisheries, we're looking at tourism, we're looking at marine biodiversity protection, we're looking at shoreline stabilization and um, flood control, uh, pollution control, um, and provision of water, fresh, good quality water. Um, and uh, shoreline stabilization. So what we have the students do is we have them organize themselves into groups and to pick an ecosystem service and then think about how a marine spatial planning endeavor what can help protect and in, and in some cases enhance that service. And we have them go through the, the standard steps that I talked about earlier, the visioning, the collection of data, uh, the analysis of data and the finally the, the planning measures that involve not just the spatial decisions on where boundaries are for certain kinds of zones or certain kinds of um, management regimes, but also the policies that are attached to those um, spaces. And it's very interesting because the ultimately the kind of goal, in other words, the kind of service that is um, set as the, the one that needs to be maximized, um, really determines the planning scope, so the physical scope of the area that needs to be considered in their marine spatial plan, the type of stakeholders that need to be engaged in the process, and, of course, the kinds of data um, that need to be collected in order to support the process. So we see this, and we, this is a small experiment that we do every year, and we see how people struggle with this question of, are the data sufficient? Um, do they 
give us the kind of information we need to know how to um, influence human behavior and human use of marine systems to preserve those ecosystem values? Um, how can we use the data to actually think about uh, who to engage and in what manner and so forth? The data needs really reflect those desires, those goals of planning. So when we think about um, the goal of maximizing production of natural resources like fisheries, we might be focused on population dynamics data more than other kinds of data. If we're really focused on managing for multiple use, then we're really needing to not only understand the ecosystem, but also the existing patterns of use um, and the projections into the future of how that use might change. We, um, we might have an MSP that really maximizes conservation and really is focused on protecting endangered species. There, the kind of data needed to support that is not only information about those species, but also the, the salient threats to, to those species. And then finally, because cultural values are so important to consider in marine spatial planning in almost every, every um, MSP process that's out, that, out there, understanding what values people attach um, to oceans and coasts is critically important. And that those kind of data need to support marine spatial planning as well. I'm going to end very soon, but I just want to say that um, I, I here I show my ecologist bias a little bit, but I, I firmly believe that a basic understanding of ecosystem function, of connectivity, and of where ecologically important areas are is, the, is absolutely vital to achieving whatever goals are set out for MSP. That's kind of the, the blueprint for moving forward towards sustainability, no matter what that path looks like. Uh, those basic kinds of data are absolutely critical in every situation. And I'm sure you'll hear, hear from the next two presenters um, how those kinds of data are used in MSP processes um, in their solution cases. In the end, what we're really talking about is um, the need to really move forward quickly, efficiently, take the data we have uh, and use it to the fullest potential. Often the data we have is not the data we need, but we can use marine spatial planning not only to affect better management, but also to target our research so that those data gaps get quickly filled. So with that, I'd like to stop. Um, I guess we um, I'll leave it up to Sarah and Jan about how, how questions will be handled, but I, um, I encourage you to listen to the next two solutions providers who will present some exciting information um, about how data is used in their particular cases. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tundi, for your very inspiring talk. Uh, thank you also for your clear statements you made right at the beginning. Uh, I'm sure that we will come back to those uh, during our discussion. So uh, let's listen to our second presenter, our first solution provider for today. It's John Day. Uh, John was a protected area planner and manager in Australia for 39 years, 28 years of which were in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park until John retired in 2014. As one of the directors at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, John was variously responsible for conservation, planning, heritage, particularly world heritage, indigenous partnerships and developing methodologies for the first Great Barrier Reef Outlook report. A highlight of John's career was his role in the Representative Areas Program, the major rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef between 99 and 2004, that subsequently received numerous awards. For his efforts, John was awarded an Australian Public Service Medal and a Smithsonian Queensland Fellowship. John is widely published and cited, but in 2015 he started a post-career PhD at the ARC Center for Coral Reef Studies at James Cook University, Townsville, Australia. So John is probably the most experienced marine PhD student we have worldwide. John, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm going to talk about the Great Barrier Reef in this uh, MSP exercise. 
And for those who don't understand where it is on the northeast coast of Australia, it's that dark blue area shown here on the map, uh, extending from the coastline out to its widest point, 250 kilometres offshore, way out beyond the coral reefs. Uh, the area of the park is 344,000 square kilometres. So it's about the same size as Italy, Germany or Japan. And the length of the park is 2,300 kilometres long. So if it's placed on the west coast of the USA, it would stretch from Canada down to the Mexican border. One of the key tools that we use for management uh, throughout the marine park is the statutory zoning plan. Uh, the MSP process that we went through to achieve this plan occurred, as Jan said, between 99 and 2003, and the current zoning network was the outcome. The different coloured zones shown in the top right uh, become more restrictive as you move from the light blue colour on the left across to the pink zone. And the various activities down the left-hand side show uh, the sort of activities that can occur in zones, which ones need a permit and uh, which ones are not allowed. If we zoom in, you can see a small area and you can see the zone boundaries. And many people are amazed to see what we've got are straight lines between GPS points, largely. It turns out these are far easier to enforce on the water than curved lines or circles. If we look at um, uh, the blue solutions I'll be talking about today, the first one I'm going to talk about is one called effective zoning as a key spatial planning tool. And I'm going to address two of the, uh, what we call building blocks. The first one is this one about using the best available knowledge. And the second one I'll be talking about is something Tundi touched on, the limitations of decision support tools. The second solution that I'll be talking about today is one about public participation which I think is a really key part of any planning process. Again, I'm just going to talk about two building blocks. Uh, one is using uh, written public submissions during the planning. And the second part, I want to talk about the views of those who don't want to get involved, the sort of silent majority. Um, the third solution I'm going to talk about is about implementing MSP. And again here, I'm just going to talk about one building block in this case, and I'm going to be talking about thinking outside the marine box, uh, what I call EBM or ecosystem-based management. What I'd like to show you quickly is a slide summarising the main phases of what we went through in MSP in the Great Barrier Reef. So in the first phase, we had an old zoning plan or plans and the realisation we weren't doing the job of protecting biodiversity. So we actually collated a lot of data and used that to prepare a map of bioregions. So effectively, this area in the red circle is where we used a lot of uh, different data to help collate and prepare that map of bioregions and the planning principles. However, then we moved into a phase of basically public involvement, and we're required by law to have two phases. The first phase generated 10,000 public submissions, which helped us develop the draft plan. The second phase commented on that draft plan and in that phase, we received 21,000 public submissions, which were all considered to help come up with the final plan, which was then presented to Parliament and became law in mid-2004. So that's effectively the zoning process we went through, or the MSP process. This is a map of what we call our bioregions, and the expert scientists help us develop this map of bioregions, the 70 bioregions, which were really a critical sort of underlying basis for the zoning network we came up with. And at the end, the zoning network basically uh, prov uh, provided examples of all those 70 bioregions in the new no-take network. So I want to quickly talk about some of the lessons we learned. And I think there's really two key lessons I'm talking about here. The first one is not waiting for that perfect data. If you wait for perfect data, it's unrealistic. And if you keep trying to get perfect data, you'll really never start. So remember, these marine areas are very dynamic. They're always changing. And the levels and patterns of use are also changing. So you're far better to proceed with the best available information. Uh, take on new information that comes on. But basically, uh, also be mindful that some people say, oh, look, we need just a bit more information. That's often just a delaying tactic to not even get into it. The second key message is, um, also recognising that the data doesn't have to come just from the researchers. Often the people who are out on the water, whether they're fishermen or tourist operators, they know as much, if not more, than many of the researchers. 
So if you can combine the knowledge from them with the scientific uh, data, you can actually augment and, and get the best of both worlds. I want to quickly move on to another uh, aspect that Tundi talked about, and this is decision support tools. These three maps here, uh, the top one is one of the final outputs from running Marksan in the Great Barrier Reef. The middle map is the draft zoning plan for the same area, and the bottom map is the final result, uh, revised plan as it was submitted to Parliament. And you can see if you compare those three maps, substantial changes from what Mark Sand was recommending, based largely on the social, on the sorry, the ecological information, and what was finally socially and politically acceptable in the bottom map. So again, if we look at some of the lessons learnt, I think there's several that I'd like to talk about. The first one, um, and I think Tundi again talked about this. While analytical tools can help develop spatial outcomes, they rarely give you the final outcome or the final sort of politically acceptable pragmatic solution. Mainly because you can't put a lot of the social economic data uh, into it, and nor can you have the sort of political trade-offs that occur. They won't go into the political, sorry, into the analytical tools. What I've also seen around the world is planners using far or placing far much too much emphasis on uh, doing MSP with very limited or patchy data. And they're hoping that the, uh, the decision support tool will produce the right answer. But it's important to remember if you've got poor data going in, uh, your output out is, is also going to be very poor. So I want to stress in the Great Barrier Reef, Mark Sand did not produce the final zoning network. But what we did use was Mark Sand for what we call post hoc accounting. It was very effective to help us audit the planning uh, options that were generated by the planners. And this was a really valuable part of the overall process. I want to now move on to discuss the importance of uh, data derived from public participation. In the Great Barrier Reef, we're bound by law to, to uh, engage the public at least twice when we're planning. The first is to collate comments to help prepare the draft plan. And this is a copy of the draft plan that was released. And we asked the public to comment. And as I said, we received 21,000 submissions between the draft plan and the final plan. If I just toggle back between this final plan and the draft plan, you can see the huge changes that occurred between the two documents based largely on those public submissions. So public submissions did have a very major impact in the final zoning network. I want to stress there was other data that came in, but well, it was used, like the vessel monitoring system information. But I also want to stress this wasn't token engagement. The public submissions really did play an enormous role. So again, if we think about some of the lessons learnt, I think there's some really important lessons about uh, public participation in the data. And I, in the solution I've done of this, I've talked about six different aspects, things like correcting misinformation and how to effectively engage the politicians throughout the planning process. We certainly learnt a lot dealing with the 31,000 submissions. So I think the key things to bring to your attention is really looking carefully at how you analyse those submissions. It's not about the numbers of what at times a comment is said, it's really about what it, the substance of what is said, the quality of the arguments made. We also learned quite quickly how to ask more effective questions to get good submissions. Uh, in our first case, we asked very open-ended questions in our initial submissions. We got long rambling answers. So we learned very quickly to hand out um, a very simple two-page submission form with specific questions which really helped us with the coding. And we also learned how to more effectively deal with maps. I want to quickly talk about not in, uh, ignoring the views of the silent majority. Remember, you'll have lots of submissions or lots of uh, noisy minority people at public meetings. But you also need to understand those other views. Because remember, it's the politicians aren't just interested in the, in the noisy minority or who attends public meetings. The politicians really need to know the wider community view. So you've got to think about ways to try and engage or learn that wider community view. So think about things like telephone polling or internet surveys or even face-to-face -face interviews. Those sort of ways you can then determine what is the wider view and provide that to your political masters. The last building block I want to talk about is this one of thinking outside the box. Because I think it's often uh, really important 
when you're doing MSP to not just confine yourself to your marine area. I often hear about planners who are doing a, an MSP process who really are only thinking about the marine site, not thinking about what happens around it, whether that's from the land or even the adjoining marine waters. So you really do need to think uh, for effective marine conservation outside the marine realm. As we know, we're downstream of most other activities, so you need to work with others to better manage those adjoining coastal waters or the catchments. And while we use the term sort of marine spatial planning, I think it's also important that we, as I said, go beyond the marine and think very much with other agencies, terrestrial, local government and industries, and get their um, help in developing a better plan for your MSP area. In this graphic here, I try and sort of show how MSP might relate to some of the other things that you might hear, like ocean zoning or EBM. The way I see it, ocean zoning is really sort of two-dimensional and combined literally to the, the water. Marine spatial planning is multi-dimensional often, and I'd really encourage you to think multi-dimensional when you're doing your MSP. So zoning might be one layer in your multi-dimensional planning, but there may be many other layers of management. But again, marine spatial planning is still just confined to the wet bits. And talking before, as I mentioned, about the need to have that interface with the land and sea and the coastal areas, that's where I think the EVM approach brings in both the multi-dimensional and the um, land-sea interface. And so to be effective when you're doing your MSP, I believe you need to think about all these layers of management shown in this diagram, not just MSP alone. Certainly that's what has occurred in the Great Barrier Reef. We've got multiple layers of management and they're all integrated and collectively they provide that overall comprehensive management framework. So just to finish up, I think if uh, coming back to our webinar topic, um, the data or desire to drive MSP, talking about the successful rezoning in the Great Barrier Reef, it did rely on these four things shown here. Best available scientific knowledge, high level of public participation, effective leadership and the consequent social political support. But I really want to stress it was the last three that most important. We could have had perfect data in the Great Barrier Reef and not achieved an outcome if we didn't have the public on side and then consequently the politicians. So I would sort of finish up by saying use the best available data, but don't forget at the end of the day most of these MSP processes are really socio-political and so you must really fully consider the social, cultural, economic and political aspects throughout your planning. So I think I'd say both data and desire are essential. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to you, hearing all your rich experiences and insights from Australia. And as you said, you have uh, many blue solutions curated on the online platform four at the moment and I know that you're working on the fifth one and uh, so if you have questions to John of course you can ask him later on in our Q&A session but you can also browse through his blue solutions uh, on the Planet Panorama platform. So I want to repeat for those who joined us later that there is a question panel in the GoToWebinar pop-up panel and uh, you can type in your questions to the speakers whenever you want and uh, after our next presentation we will then go to the discussion session. So our last presenter for today is Michelle Portman. Dr. Portman graduated the UC Berkeley with a Bachelor in Political Econ Economy of Natural Resources, the Technion with a Master in Urban and Regional Planning and the University of Massachusetts with a PhD in Public Policy. Currently her research focuses on aspects of integrated coastal zone management, marine spatial planning, management of marine protected areas, marine litter from land-based sources, water sensitive planning and generally on governance of the land-sea interface. She heads the Marcos Ecosystem Integration Lab and is author of a new book entitled Environmental Planning for Oceans and Coasts, Tools, Methods and Technologies. Over the past three years she has led the recently completed Technion Israel Marine Plan. Michelle, we are very happy that you're with us and the floor is yours. Michelle, you're mu you are muted, so you want to unmute yourself as well. 
<laughs> okay, how's that? Great. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar, and I wanted to thank the two speakers who spoke before me. I'm going to relate to some of the things that they talked about. Um, also, in terms of uh, my credentials and my background, I just wanted to mention that I worked on the Israel, uh, the Technion Israel Marine Plan together with Professor Shamaya Seif, who uh, was actually my partner in leading the planning process. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, using an online interactive tool for public participation, transparency, and decision making. And I'm going to talk uh, also, I'm going to relate that to what um, I submitted as a blue, as a blue solution um, that's on the Blue Solutions website. And I'm going to talk a little bit also about the planning process that we use to arrive at the Israel Marine Plan even though um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit more about the building blocks to that and using the interactive tool and another tool as well, um, and a little bit less on the plan itself. Okay, so um, as Tuni mentioned, and it's really true, and certain we, certainly we started our planning process this way, was that we developed a vision for the marine space of Israel. And this was the first time there was a, um, a consolidated effort to look farther than the territorial waters of the state of Israel, to look farther than that, and look at uh, the exclusive economic zone area. I'll show you a map of that in a minute. In a minute, in the meantime, you can see in the bottom here of the slide that there's a URL. But that is the, the site that we have, the website that we have uh, with all the uh, information about the plan. Um, so here we have the, the vision of the Israel Marine Plan, which was the first step in the process. And I want to just emphasize a few points here um, that I think are going to be relevant to what I'm talking about uh, in terms of my blue solution. So um, the first is environmental resilience was important. Uh, the second um, the mentioning of future generations, which of course is, is very important for sustainability, looking to the future, uh, looking to use resources in a way that will not prevent future generations from using those same resources. Um, we wanted to, to arrive at a process that would um, propose uh, spatially explicit areas that would um, be ecologically sound or activities that would be allowed in those areas that would be ecologically sound. And of course, uh, there's an emphasis on promoting uh, marine research and knowledge for the realization of international responsibility and regional cooperation as much as that's possible. Um, so these, these particular points were very much connected to the to a few things that I want to put an emphasis on here and what I'm going to talk about. One is this idea of the data, and the other is the, is the idea of marine conservation or protecting of the marine environment, which of course connects very well into uh, what Tundi talked about as well as what John talked about. And the fact that we need to, uh, we need to move forward with marine planning uh, in a way that is um, ecosystem-based and protects the environment so that we don't end up in a situation where we're, we're basically over-exploiting the resources that we, that we depend on. So, and I think that's, I just want to make a point regarding the idea of planning. I don't think that marine planning is very different than terrestrial planning. And I have a master's degree in planning. And I started out as a terrestrial planner. So, so I don't think that marine planning is that different. The, the, what is different is the fact that we're, come, we're starting at a later point in time with this idea of planning. And the threats to the marine environment are, are clear and uh, immediate and urgent. And I think that's, that's a big difference. So we have to be very careful as we move in to doing more and more marine spatial planning. So here uh, in this map, you'll see um, where Israel is located. And you'll, this uh, light blue area is the area that um, 
is approximately 26,000 square kilometers, and it's the exclusive economic zone of the state of Israel. It doesn't go as far out as 200 nautical miles from the shoreline because we're in the Mediterranean, and as you can see, uh, we butt up against the exclusive economic zones of other countries. Again, I've got the URL here of um, the, the plan. So this is the area that we're talking about, and this is the area that we addressed in the planning process. Um, okay, and as I mentioned, I wanted to t I want to talk uh, more specifically about the um, the building blocks or the blue solution that I submitted, and it's on the blue solutions website, and it's called entitled Interactive and Transparent Approach in Marine Spatial Planning. And um, there are two building blocks that I want to focus on in, my, in the rest of my talk. The first that I'm going to talk about is uh, looking at the compatibilities between the different activities proposed in the marine environment or the different activities considered during the marine spatial planning process. Uh, and the second is uh, this GIS-based interactive online decision-making tool. Okay, so first and second. All right, so the first um, building block that uh, is very important that I want to um, emphasize here is, is looking at the compatibility of different, considering the compatibility of different activities in the marine environment. And here we have uh, a matrix that we built um, one, of, one of two that we have in the, in the plan, if you go to the English version of the plan via our, our website, you can actually see this. Um, I think it's some 20 page document, the English version, so it's easy to find. You can, you can actually take a look, a close look at this matrix and basically it looks at the different activities uh, and uh, in matrix form and compares one to another and considers whether or not there is synergy or there could be synergy between the two activities, whether there, there's no conflict whatsoever, uh, whether there's a need for coordination, a strong need for coordination, or whether it's clear that the two activities will be in conflict. And this, I think, relates to this idea of um, what was mentioned before about uh, competing interests, uh, designating uh, different activities in different areas. This is a, a huge help. It, it's nothing, it's not rocket science, it's nothing new. It's actually kind of based on uh, something that's been around for several decade, decades already, an approach, uh, the Leopold matrix, which looks at the impact of activities on the environment. And that's a seg Michelle, we can't hear you. Sarah? Um, Michelle, yeah, it looks like she just muted. Michelle, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I, I moved. I moved that little box, and I moved it. I guess by clicking on the mic. Okay. Sorry. Okay. We um, we Sorry. missed you for about probably about thirty seconds. If you could go back a little bit, at least to the start of the slide. Okay. Okay. So 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 here's this. This is actually. Uh, this matrix is actually closer to what's called traditionally the a Leopold matrix, which is a technique that was developed in the 1970s um, and looks at the impact of activities on the environment. And here you have um, a list of different activities that could have uh, an impact particularly on natural resources, which is ecological aspects of the environment, heritage, and cultural resources in the marine space. And here you can see on the, the, um, uh, the legend here that uh, the different symbols here indicate changes to views, changes, and if we're talking about cultural resources, then aesthetics is, aesthetics is important, and that's the connection to the observed, observed view. Um, we, uh, we supposed here a certain uh, level of damage or change to uh, 
either no change or no damage, uh, no significant damage, damage according to the symbol, each one of the different uh, activities. And then you can see on the top that we have the list of different elements of the environment, of either natural resources, cultural, or heritage, what are called heritage resources. So these are the two different types of matri matrices that we use. Okay, so I've gone over the visions and the goals, and again, I want to stress that the matrices and the compatibility, looking at the compatibility of the different activities was an exercise that we did to actually see uh, how we can support the different goals that were derived, of course, from the vision. Um, okay, so the second building block that I want to focus on is this uh, interactive tool, okay, and uh, I'm actually going to do a switch over here. If it gets complicated, I'm going to go um, just a second. Okay, here it is. All right, so I, I have a few screenshots in the slide presentation, but I just thought I would show you live. This is actually from the website. Okay, you can, take, you can go into this interactive tool. It's called the ASDA, which translates from, he into he from Hebrew to platform. Okay, uh, it's just the name that we took uh, platform because of its marine connotations and platform because of its uh, technological connotations and we adopted that name for the for, for the tool itself and if you uh, go into our website if you look for the ASDA and click on that button you can go into you can get into this uh, interactive tool so um, you can see here that on the left side of the screen that we have uh, a number of different layers that you can you can see you can um, activate inactivate uh, just by clicking on them. There's a there's another another few tools here that are um, important and can be used. Uh, they, this I think relates to this whole idea of data. First of all, it was a it's a way to organize the data. It this is a tool that was used by the staff, the planning staff at stakeholder meetings, by stakeholders, uh, by the public at large. And uh, another, if I've already got this open, another uh, important thing is the ability to change the scale very easily. Okay, and these are different layers of uh, proposed activities. Actually, at this point, what I'm showing here right now are uh, allocated activities. So you can see the dotted green lines are shipping lanes, the, um, the polygons that are kind of orange colored polygons are, are leases for uh, natural gas, ex either exploration or exploitation. Um, okay, and now I'm going to go back to show you some of the more interactive parts of this. Just a minute. So here I am back on the screenshot from the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, and you can see up there in the right-hand corner, there's a smaller map that shows the exclusively economic zone, the area that it, we addressed in the plan, the, the light or the darker blue strip along the shore are the, is the territorial waters of the state of Israel. Okay, so when I said interactive, what did I mean? So the idea here is not only to present the information. And this this um, GIS online tool was available almost from the beginning of the planning process. When we started putting up layers and layers of information for the public to see, for us to show at meetings. Um, and the there's an opportunity here to actually add in elements, for example, dots, polygons, lines. Okay, you can see that on the left side. And that uh, is explained here in English. Obviously, the interface is in Hebrew. Um, there's also an opportunity here to leave a message or a comment. So that was another way for us to solicit uh, uh, public uh, feedback from what we were doing and get some ideas. And of course, uh, just one more thing on this. It's a two-way process. It's something that uh, John also alluded to. That there's when you the public participation process is is, is really a two-way process it's not just that the experts are or the planners are 
talking to the public. We're also interested in learning from the public about what they know, particularly fishermen, um, uh, uh, sailors, a recreationists. There's, there's really a lot that, that planners can learn about the marine environment from those who use the marine environment, obviously. So, um, okay, then the last point that I, that I want to bring up that relates directly to the interactive tool it, and what I've shown you in terms of the screens is the spatially explicit marine areas that we arrived at through the planning process and how they can be seen on the interactive tool. All right, so we ended up with uh, pr proposing five types of spatially explicit marine areas that were kind of have their, their they're basically different levels of protection or different levels of activity. You can see it either way. Um, and those were um, conservation-driven, use-driven. They're, they're kind of on a, on a scale between those two um, extremes, I guess. And then uh, in terms of the, the, the planning side of this, uh, there's reactive planning. And then there's interpreneurial planning, which is translated on this uh, schematic as an initiative. In other words, the type of the type of planning where one comes and actually proposes something particular in a particular location where it wasn't before. And then reactive is more where you come up with certain standards or certain conditions that need to be met uh, to to regulate the activity. That more responsive, I guess, in nature. Um, okay, so we have different areas. Uh, I'm going to run through this really quickly so that we can see it in the interactive tool. Um, two, two different uh, areas that we had were uh, protected marine integrated, marine integrated, and then... Um, oh, okay, and then you can see all the five different, the marine, the five different areas. The marine horizon was actually, um, I think it's a seven kilometers out from shore, and it basically deals with the aesthetics of the horizon, what is seen, focusing on cultural resources and aesthetics views from the seashore. So here I have a screenshot uh, taken from a screen off the interactive. As I was using the interactive tool, I took a screenshot. Um, the spatial explicit areas are one of the layers that you can actually choose here on the left side. I'm sorry, it's in Hebrew, so you can't see what's written there. But it's, it's basically uh, you have the opportunity to choose any of those five different areas to be shown. And here I've got them all up in this screenshot. Um, lastly, I want to um, talk about the challenges that we had, particularly the challenges in using the uh, decision support tool, if you want to call it that, or the inter interactive online uh, as doc, right? It was challenging. And I, and I agree with everything <laughs> that was said so far about decision support tools. Uh, they do not provide the solution. And I want to emphasize that, OK? Um, we found out that uh, there were certain pluses and, of course, certain minuses for disadvantages or, I would say, impediments or challenges is probably a better word. So the pluses were that we were able to, um, to uh, solicit more participation. Some people don't make it to meetings. Uh, and this was an opportunity to reach out to a larger public. It's a one-stop shop for, shop for information. By going to the SDA, a, a lot of information can be seen in a very, very short time, it can be accessed. Um, it's easy to change scales. This was a huge, huge um, uh, benefit. When we sat at meetings, particularly with our international advisory group, who, don't, who didn't understand Hebrew, they couldn't really sit in our, in our public meetings that we had and, uh, and learn from them. Um, they couldn't access all the written information, so when we were when we were trying to, to inform them about what was going on in the Israel marine space, we projected the interactive tool on a wall, and we were able to 
to scale in, zoom in, zoom out, it was, and it was put up to, to put up different layers. It was very, very um, advantageous. And then, of course, the two-way learning that I mentioned before, the opportunity for the public to submit comments and actually draw and edit on the map itself and then send in a comment about what they've drawn, what they've, what they've indicated, what they've um, designated as a polygon, for example. Um, and then the ac accessibility. Oops. Okay. And then, just quickly, um, the, the, the largest problem was that we found that we had to really um, go over and over, and we couldn't, we couldn't um, promote the tool enough. Uh, it was hard to get people to use it. Uh, and it, not every, not, of course, not everyone is tech savvy. Some people felt, you know, that it was going to be too complicated or, you know, there were some bugs. And so it was difficult in that way. And then I don't think there was um, a strong consensus among the planning staff about the value of this type of a tool. So those were the two challenges, uh, most significant challenges, I would say. So to summarize, um, the Blue Solutions building blocks in, in front, from the experience, based on the experience of the Israel Marine Plan, include in compatibility matrices, which proved to be a good way to consider the impacts of different activities to the marine environment. And again, stressing this idea of ecosystem-based management, impacts to the environment, the fact that we need to be very careful in moving forward. Um, interactive, secondly, interactive data tools for decision-making decision have both advantages and disadvantages that need to be considered. And of course, the context is very important. What country, what are the cultural norms, uh, how prevalent is technology, computers, etc. cetera. And um, the so-called blue solutions or, and blue growth must carefully consider the ecological aspects of the marine environment. Marine conservation must be emphasized and integrated. And I, and I say this. Um, more as a planner than, more as a general planner, I would say, than anything else. Um, I think that it's all very good that we're moving forward with marine spatial planning. And I would say in the last decade or two, it's, everyone's talking about marine spatial planning now. And when I studied planning you know, 20, 25 years ago, no one considered the marine environment. And now, you know, I have students in the School of Architecture and Town Planning that are studying marine spatial planning. So that's great, but we have to be careful that we <laughs> that we realize um, what what are the what are the special aspects of the marine environment and also where we are today in terms of the threats to the marine environment. And then finally, good data collection, display, transparency, accessibility, and interactivity can help a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle, for your great presentation. Uh, this is an example I really like because you see how we can organize data during an MSP process and, and how data gathering is also part of the process. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Sarah, I would like to share my screen. Great. Here we are. So here you see our three presenters, Tundi, John, and Michelle, and also their contact details. And now it's time to submit your question to the speakers. Uh, I have already some questions, and um, I'm trying to organize them. So um, first of all, John, you said uh, start with what you have in terms of data. And then Tundi's last slide said uh, a basic understanding is needed of ecosystem services functions, connectivity, and ecologically important areas, and that it's vital to reach all goals. So um, how does this match? Do we need a basic understanding uh, of certain patterns, or can we really start just with what we have? I think this is a question to the three of you. Well, my view is that um, you start with what you have, and as you plan, you can build on that. But as soon as you start um, holding off and, and saying we have to go and collect more data, you're, you know, as I said, you, you, you'll never get perfect data. So admit that it's uh, not perfect, but it's enough to move ahead. Um, collect more data if you need it. 
but move towards an effective outcome rather than, in our case, we didn't have a, a budget for collecting a whole lot of additional data. We we're also relatively lucky because there was a, a, a reasonably good um, basis, um, ecological and social, to start to planning. So in, in, in that case, we were lucky. But I am mindful many planning people keep saying we need more data, more data before we can start planning. My point is, no, start planning and then sometimes you'll recognise there's a, a data gap and you need to fill it. But often you can do an awful lot with what you discover as you start planning. Can I yeah, jump I would, in? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think um, uh, we had a, a time constraint in terms of the budget and the funder. So we rushed and finished within two years. But during that time, we were constantly adding more and more data. And um, I think that one thing that we didn't mention too much here in this talk today is the different steps of marine spatial planning, which are really the steps of the planning, planning in general. And usually there's, there's kind of, it's, it's an iterative process where you're, you're, you're checking and monitoring and adapting and changing things as you go along. So, so one, one of the things that you can you know, take as a, as a given is that once you've finished the process, you know, your first round of funding, your first round of planning, whatever you want to call it, then you'll, you'll have bet, better data for the update. And I'm, from my work on the uh, Massachusetts Ocean Plan, or my familiarity with it anyway, was, is that, you know, there was, from the, from the get-go, it was clear that after five years, there was going to be an update to that plan. And I'm sure that the data got better, but it's not having all the data in the very beginning for that first round was not a reason to not do the plan. Yeah, I want to agree with you both and clarify maybe what my last slide was attempting to say. So um, I think it's clear that um, practitioners can show that you can get going with incomplete data and there are ways to incentivize um, participation in the process so that you can um, enhance the data you have with um, user knowledge or tr traditional knowledge uh, and quickly uh, create a, a more solid um, data base from which to move forward. Um, I think that's clear and I think it's I think all three of us made very clear this point that you cannot use incomplete data as an excuse to do nothing that uh, we're in a time now where it's kind of a crossroads for many marine areas and we need to make uh, um, intelligent decisions about use allocation going forward uh, with the data that we have. But I just want to clarify my last point. I wasn't trying to, um, to uh, suggest that, that we needed complete ecological understanding of these systems to move forward, but rather that um, I really see MSP as a, the best embodiment we have of how to achieve um, ecosystem-based management that John was talking about. And uh, I, I really think that um, if, we, if we can assemble the information that we have to understand these connections between our marine areas that we value and want to manage um, and associated freshwater and land and um, really think about going outside of that planning box, as, as, as John mentioned, um, we have an opportunity to use MSP to achieve EBM um, everywhere where we launch MSP processes. And I think we would be um, derelict in our, in our duties to protect and conserve the marine environment if we didn't seize those opportunities. Uh, we have a question very much linked to this. Uh, one participant is asking, John, have you gotten to the point where land-based actions can be connected to zoning changes? So, uh, for example, if you reduce nutrients by X, Y, that amount, uh, can we change the zoning in Pacific places? Has that happened in Australia? Uh, the short answer is no. The way our um, zoning is um, done, it, it is basically becomes law and 
uh, under the current legislation, it can't be changed within seven years. Now, we're past that seven-year period now, but it is a huge process to change zoning. So I want to stress this idea of multi-level management. Zoning is only one of many tools in our toolkit. We have many other tools that you can use. So there, there are other types of um, spatial management, what we call special management areas or plans of management. These are much finer scale. Um, in some cases can be brought in through regulation. So it's not a, an act of parliament like the zoning. So the short answer is no, the zoning itself can't be changed but we can look at other levels of management and, and tweaking management using these other multi-levels um, of spatial and temporal management. I hope that makes sense. Yes, uh, thank you very much, John. Um, so we heard from all of you that uh, data are needed for MSP and that the challenge is to get the right data and that maybe data gaps are not as constrained for MSP. Uh, so a participant is asking, is there any pattern of data to uh, build an effective marine spatial data infrastructure as part of an MSP process. Uh, well, I can chime in <laughs> on, on, yeah, on something related to that. And I think that's um, based on our experience in Israel. And that is that um, as we moved forward, we had cooperation from many gov government ministries and uh, also institutions, for example, the Israel Oceanographic Institution, which um, was doing a survey at the same time within the framework of a strategic environmental assessment for the um, exploration of the natural gas reserves which were discovered in 2010 or were confirmed to be um, in the marine space uh, in 2010 off the shore of Israel. So um, due to that effort, to the effort of kind of scrambling to get together a lot of information for the purposes of that particular activity, uh, there was uh, new, there was surveying done that was very um, helpful to us and we did our best to hook into that data to involve the people that were doing that uh, those surveys and the research and that that helped a lot so I think that there's um, it's very important to look for linkages among your stakeholder groups and see you know not just the fishermen and the um, recreationalists etc there's also, you know, opportunities for uh, different agencies to become involved, to feel that they have a stake, and to contribute. That, what I can add based on our experience. Can I jump in also? Um, I, I'm not sure that I understood the question, but I, I, I think at a minimum, um, one could organize information in a way to kind of cover all the the bases, um, and and by that I mean I, I think having uh, tried to um, suggest that we need basic information about ecosystem um, kind of st structure and function, we need to understand kind of our target area from an ecological perspective. But I think we also need very basic information on marine uses, and I'm. I'm absolutely flabbergasted at how many places I've worked in the world where that kind of basic use information, spatially georeferenced, is not readily available. That people seem to be jumping from um, recognizing the need to develop a marine spatial plan and going right into the planning without understanding the, the very use patterns that exist and, and not just um, where different marine um, uses and also um, so use rights are located in the planning um, domain but also what the impacts of that use are and um, that can be very generalized information at, at, in the starting phases of marine spatial planning but it's absolutely essential I think to to organize the information around marine uses so marine ecosystem structure and function and the kind of the connectivity bits, marine uses, 
And then what I'm seeing as a very valuable kind of uh, way to organize in initial information for launching a marine spatial planning process is this idea of trying to um, map ecosystem service values. And unfortunately, we have a very awkward kind of language around that. We still, I think we still struggle with this idea of um, trying to explain to people that um, the oceans provide many different kinds of benefits and that we can actually um, articulate what those benefits are and we can map those benefits in such a way that we can understand how, how they're made available to people. Um, if we can organize initial information in a way that we show these values and we also show how these benefits flow to beneficiaries, you know, what are the ecosystem service flows, then we know kind of who we need to engage in these um, participatory planning processes. So we know kind of what stakeholders, you know, can be actively engaged and can be incentivized, let's say, to engage in the, in the process. And the more participation we have, the more, you know, we all understand the, the more um, valid the end result of the process is and more the more buy-in for those solutions there will be and the more likelihood that these um, planning processes will result in management that can be sustained um, for the purposes of meeting the goals of marine spatial planning. So I would think at a very minimum we need those kinds of three categories of information um, to launch processes and then quickly fill, fill the data gaps um, in any way we can to ensure that our decisions are ba based on the best available information. Uh, one last question related to, um, to tools and decision support tools. Can you recommend an interactive tool uh, that is uh, useful when you start a project uh, from the scratch, really simple one uh, that is available? Can you recommend one? Oh, there's, there's a toolkit actually from, um, put out by Stanford, I think, uh, Ocean, maybe it is, I can't remember the name, it's Ocean Solutions Compass maybe, um, that has put out a pamphlet, it's already maybe four or five years old at this point, but it, it, it's a very colorful, very informative, uh, uh, goes through most of the decision support tools that are available and covers a lot of options. I would say there's at least 20 different decision support tools that are mentioned there. So um, we, we mentioned, of course, Marksan, there's Donation, there's um, CNET, there's uh, C-Sketch, which is the old, is the new uh, version of what was once called Marine Map. Um, the question is, what 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 is it going to be used for, basically? Because I think John made some really good points about Markstown that um, I've used a bit, and uh, we actually had an exercise where, well, there was uh, one, a doctoral student that, that did her part of her doctorate, at least, on um, applying Markstown also to the waters off the shores of Israel. And so we had a Markstown type uh, result that we could work with and it's, it's problematic for a, a number of reasons. One of them is because I think it's very hard to explain some of the algorithms and how they work and some of the decisions that you need to make along the way using a tool like Markstan to, uh, to the general public. So, um, so I think uh, it's, it might be a good place to start, but as John also said, uh, that you know, these these things are going to are going to change. They're going to they need to be talked about. They need to be understood. They need to be um, massaged. I would guess the solutions from some of these different decision support tools. So I, I would say um, there there are quite a few out there, uh, but you, you need to think very carefully about what you want to get out of the decision support tool and. Frankly, to be honest, our, in our process, we didn't really use the tool for decision-making. I mean, we did use it for soliciting uh, response 
to, the, to what we were proposing in terms of the different spatially explicit areas and uh, informing the public about what's going on in the ocean in the, in the um, area of our plan. But I can't really say that it was used for decision making. Uh, Jan, okay. and yeah. I just wanted to call attention, no, this is actually Sarah, I uh, yeah. pasted a link to the guide that Michelle was referring to, uh, it should appear in everyone's uh, chat and question files. Thank you. Wow. Great. Yes, thank you, Sarah. So uh, let's now talk a little bit about stakeholders and public participation. So John, there is a question to you. Uh, which were the actions that the leaders from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park conducted with the community to enhance the public participation? Uh, there was a whole lot of them and uh, I don't know where to start, but one of the key ones that I continually remind people is that we found that public meetings were not an effective way to engage. As planners, we are often invited to public meetings, but we learned very quickly that they were not the um, most effective way. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about it now. I'm just about to publish a paper talking about the lessons on the public participation. But there are many other ways you can effectively engage, and public meetings are not my preferred way. Um, there's lots of um, things that need to be done. One of the points I'd also recommend, this isn't something you just do at one particular point. It has to happen literally throughout the whole planning process. Um, so there's both formal engagement and, and informal. And um, it's also important, as I said before, not to make it the seen as token. So you have to be able to show that you are listening and taking on board those considerations, but nor giving false hope to people that everything they say will, will be uh, um, incorporated in the plan. Clearly at the end of the Great Barrier Reef zoning, I think every stakeholder group involved was a little bit aggrieved. No one got exactly what they wanted, so we felt it was sort of a balanced approach. So I think it's important with this not to give false expectations to politicians, to stakeholder groups, that they're going to get exactly what they want. But I think the important point is to encourage them to get involved and to have their input and to ensure that it's understood by the planners. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Michelle, how was your experience in, in Israel? Did the, your interactive platform help to engage public or did people, I say normal people, had difficulties uh, in using this uh, highly elaborated tool? Uh, well, it's interesting. I, we're still getting responses even now and it's, you know, we've basically, the last December we officially finished working on, that, that was the end of the three years. Um, we had two years of the planning process and then we had another year of basically update and looking at how, uh, whether or not certain aspects and what aspects of our plan were being, were being adopted. So, so we've been finished for a while and we're still getting responses from, through the, the, the platform. Um, but I would say that it wasn't the response that we were expecting. It was, I think we needed to promote the tool a lot more. And um, I think at every single meeting, we had, we had different types of meetings. We had meetings with experts. We had meetings with uh, public at large. We had meetings with NGOs. We had, you know, there were different levels of meetings and that, we, that we had that could be characterized as participatory meetings, basically on, um, and, I think at every single one of those meetings, we needed to open the platform and use it as it, rather than a lot of times we had uh, PowerPoint presentations with PDF shots of you know this this map or that map or this layer or that layer. We, we needed to use the um, the platform, the interactive online platform, you know, via the internet every single time we met, and that that didn't happen. So I think that was that that would have made that that would have promoted the use of the tool more and that was something that we failed to do basically so um, my advice would be to <laughs> to really uh, use it at every single opportunity and perhaps have a session on how to use it at the end of one of the stakeholder meetings uh, 
and, and we had some bugs and that weren't uh, taken care of right away, things like that. So it, it was a learning process. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Tundi, you want to have a take on this one? Well, actually, I was going to ask a, um, a related question, so maybe I could throw it out there instead of trying to answer that one. And that was, I was going to ask both John and Michelle about how to incentivize um, participation, whether that participation is um, stakeholder um, participation in the planning process, so through an interactive tool or through public meetings, or whether that process is um, trying to get user information, how do we incentivize that participation uh, and make it a, a, a mutually um, beneficial <laughs> kind of interaction? So uh, I think we often look at user groups and want to get information from them without offering much in return. And I just wonder about, uh, John, you mentioned uh, the need to reach out and hear what the um, silent majorities use are, but to actually incentivize participation and related to that I've always been struggling with this question of how to build the capacity of certain kinds of stakeholders to effectively engage in processes when some some stakeholder um, groups are, are unable to either physically participate in a process or um, don't have the capacity to um, engage in dialogue in the same way that other <laughs> stakeholders do. So I throw that out there as a, a kind of, uh, not that I'm trying to avoid answering the, the question that was posed, but I think um, I'd love to, in the few minutes remaining, hear your thoughts on, on that because I think it would be helpful perhaps for our audience. Well, I certainly agree, Tundi, that, you know, it can't be a, a one-way flow of information. Um, we were lucky in the Great Barrier Reef and that the public involvement process has been around for, uh, you know, right back to the 1980s when we first started doing zoning. So the public have got used to providing submissions and interacting. But I, I agree um, people need to be able to see that this isn't just token, they're just not giving information that's going to a black hole or not being considered. So I made the point earlier about being upfront um, and, and being quite open about how that information is used. If someone came into our office and asked to see, uh, we could very quickly pull up their submission and show how it had been coded, showed how the information had uh, been considered. But again, the point is not promising to everyone that every bit of information is going to make a change to the, the final zoning plan. So I agree it's a, it's a hard one to incentivize, but I think it's important. But if people recognise um, this is their opportunity to have a say, as I said, without getting false hopes or false um, impressions, but also showing them that it is true uh, consultation, engagement, and that huge changes can occur, um, or, or even minor changes, but you know people can be listened to, and the planners don't know certainly everything about the area. Uh, we learned a huge amount from those public submissions from fishermen and people who have been out there for literally decades and knew far more about it than the researchers and, and us as planners. So it was very useful for us to get their information, but I think we were able to give them information back. So it was a two-way two flow of information. And as I said, at the end of the process, no one in the Great Barrier Reef uh, rezoning could argue they didn't have their opportunity to have their say. They certainly weren't all happy at the very end with the final outcome. Uh, most people saw it as a compromise, but they could understand that they'd had their input and could see where their input had made a change. Thank you, John. Michelle, you want to reply to this? Yeah, just briefly. Um, yeah, I think that um, uh, from my experience working as a planner for the city of Boston, that the minute people think that what they're going to bring to the table is not going to be listened to, that's a huge disincentive disincentive to even bother. So I think that there needs to be really a, a serious um, effort to, to make stakeholders feel, in the public, feel that they um, can make a difference and that they're being listened to. Um, and then the, the second thing that I want to say is that um, I teach in my classes about the public trust doctrine. And the reason I know about the public trust doctrine is because I worked uh, on a regulatory program for the 
state of Massachusetts that basically uh, implements a law that, or administers a law that implements that doctrine. So people don't really, they don't realize that the, that the ocean and its resources are held in public trust and that they're, that they belong to all people, most people, and that, that stakeholders uh, or I should say the general public has a stake in what goes on in the ocean and the importance of the ocean. So I would say that there's a bit of kind of an educational effort that needs, needs to, be, to be made. I don't know, I don't know exactly how to do that, but um, certainly uh, uh, on a practical level, I think having meetings held in communities, perhaps near the ocean, but in different communities, rather than expecting the public to come to, to, to where the meeting is, the planners should perhaps go out into the community and meet, meet and, and do it that way. Um, at least that, that would, I guess, is more a logistical point, but all those things together. Thank you very much. We still have a lot of questions around climate change related uh, to MSP, policy support for MSP, around decision support tools, but unfortunately we are running off time. So my suggestion is uh, that all the ones who still have questions uh, that have not been answered yet, contact our speakers if they want to. Afterwards, you have the contact details um, for further discussion. You can, can use it because we're running off time and have to close our session, unfortunately. But uh, thanks, everybody, who has participated in the audience. Particular thanks to our three presenters. You were great. Thanks for sharing your experiences and insights. Also, thanks to Sarah for making this webinar work. Sarah has also shared uh, two guides on decision support tools in the chat box. Thanks for this. And I would also like to invite everybody to visit our Blue Solutions website and the Panorama platform where you can find out more information about the solutions of our today's speakers and about other solutions related to MSP. I would like also to especially highlight a training course that we have developed and that is related to our today's topic. It is called Blue Planning in Practice. Uh, it is a, a training course on coastal marine spatial planning and it's very practical introduction for decision makers and practitioners who are involved in planning and management processes. You can also find more information on this on the Blue Solutions website. Uh, in this Panorama webinar series, we will soon offer further sessions. For this year, we still have planned one session on sustainable conservation finance. Um, and this webinar was also recorded, and you will find it on the Blue Solutions webpage and on open channels. So uh, thanks again, everybody. Have a nice day. Have a nice evening, wherever you are. And I hope to see you at the next webinar. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot.